The teaching this week comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 25. Hear the word of the Lord. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile and return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have returned to the shepherd and overseer, of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. To a dispersed, marginalized, and persecuted people, Peter is going to address a very real question for them and a very real question for us. In a, in a world that is full of evil and injustice, how do Christians live out in the public square? How, how do we live as Christians, not just in the church, not just in the home, but out in the world. In a world with unjust government officials, with unjust masters, owners, bosses, what, what should the Christian's posture be? Peter's answer is likely going to make most of us uncomfortable. The Bible is not written to make any of us comfortable. This text certainly will not do that. His answer also is not going to come natural for any of us. But we are going to get into the text anyway. We are going to see what Peter has to say. And he's going to begin with a governing statement. A governing statement about how the Christian is to live out in the world. What the church's posture should be. Let's get into it. Verse 13. Here is his governing statement. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Okay, there it is. Be subject to every human institution. Subordinate yourself. Place yourself in a submissive posture. Now, like I said, that is going to come natural to almost no one. It's almost no one. I, I don't know of any three-year-old that naturally just wants to share with other three-year-olds. doesn't happen because this is not hardwired into us. It is not hardwired into humanity that I want to place myself in a submissive posture to someone else. But for us, most of us, uh, it, it's not simply the fact that this wasn't hardwired into humanity that has affected us. It's also that for most of us, we either grew up in the States, in America, or in Europe. Many of us in the South, where sort of Western individualism is just the air that we breathe. It is simply the air that we breathe, where the, where the mantra is this. I subordinate myself to no one. I'm an autonomous individual person, and I subordinate myself to no one. Now, uh, I, I want to I want to quickly address that because I'm afraid that if if I don't address that, we're not going to be able to really hear the rest of what Peter has to say. 
So if you were to say, I, I, I believe that I'm an autonomous individual who should subject myself to no one, um, why do you believe that? Where did you get that from? Well, if you believe that, it's because uh, your parents and your parents' parents and your parents' parents' parents passed it down to you. They passed that belief down to you. You, you inherited that belief. You didn't just come up with that on your own. Point being, even, even how you get the belief that you're an autonomous individual shows that you're not an autonomous individual. No one is. All right. So Peter's opening command. Subordinate yourself. Subject yourself to every human institution. And now he's going to give two examples of what he means. One societal, one individual. Let's keep reading. So be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. So here's his first example. Submit yourself, subject yourself to government officials. So let me, let's, let's talk about the role of government here. The role of government is this. To, to maintain order so that human life can flourish. It, it's, it's part of what we call common grace. Government is part of what we call common grace, this grace that's common to all, that's shared with all. There to protect us from chaos and destruction. And literally, when it says to punish those who do evil, it's the, the, the word punish is to do justice, to give justice to, to give justice to those who um, do evil or uh, uh, perpetuate injustice and then to hold up to praise those who do good to lead to a just society however this only works this only works when people submit to governing authorities and submission is always difficult always for you for me for all of us it is always difficult and yet the Bible consistently requires it, with very few exceptions. With very few exceptions, it says governing authorities are to be obeyed. So you might be asking, why, why is that? Why is that? I mean, I, I thought that government and the church were these completely separate arenas of authority and should have no bearing on one another. Well... Romans 13 is a parallel passage to the one that we're in, and it gives some of the, the theological backdrop to the command that Peter gives. And so here, here it is, Romans 13, verses 1 and 2, and I'm going to read verse 6. Let, let every person, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So qualifier on that. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Verse 6, For because of this you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Okay. Here's the theological backdrop to Peter's command. All authority is from God, including that of government. And to resist the authority of government is to resist God because authorities are ministers of God. Civic, governmental authorities, it says, are ministers of God. Now, the word minister is not the, uh, probably the typical word that you think of. Uh, minister, when you, you know, as I'm a minister and you are a minister of the gospel of Christ, that's not what it necessarily means. It's um, it's, it's a word that's used only a few times in the scriptures. It's used of angels in uh, Hebrews 1. It means that they are administrating God's plan in the world. To be a minister, it means that they are administering, administrating God's plan in the world. So, sojourn. Let's talk about our decision to listen to uh, government officials as part of our decision-making process on when we gather in person again. By listening to government officials, we are not 
bending a knee to someone other than Christ. We are participating in the authority structure that God has put in place for the good of all. If we believe that all authority comes from God, i.e., if we believe Romans 13, then submitting to government officials is an expression of our submission to God. Therefore, while government officials are not responsible to make our decisions for us, us giving weight to the recommendations is one way that we work for the good of all. But you might be asking, what if government officials are not reliable? What, what if they lack the integrity or the competency to make good decisions? Well, it, it might be helpful to know who the emperor was when Peter was writing this letter. The, the emperor, when Peter was writing this letter, was a man named Claudius or a man named Nero. A little debate on the, the, the dating of the letter, one or the other. Which means, when Peter was writing this letter, either the church was being... Um, marginalized, scattered, and marginalized, or actively and violently persecuted. Which means, which means that the emperor did not recognize God's authority, did not recognize his authority as coming from God, and into that context with wicked rulers, not rulers we disagree with, wicked rulers, Peter's command and directive is the same. Subject yourself, submit yourself, be submissive to government authorities. How can we do that? How can we do that? How, how can we submit ourselves, in, in Peter's context, to governing authorities who are marginalizing and persecuting the church? Because we trust a God who will who will, who will have a final judgment, a day where the Caesars of history will give an account to God. And we let God do what God is going to do. We play our part right now in our obedience to the commands of the scriptures as Peter and Romans gives them. We don't bring final judgment into today. We trust the final judgment to God. And when we do, when our life is marked by submission, here's what happens. Back to 1 Peter, verse 15. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. See, here, here, here's why. Here's what happens when we are obedient to the commands of Scripture and follow Peter's directive right here. We, we silence the arguments of foolish people. You see, here's what Peter knows. Here's what Peter knows. That Christians taking a submissive posture in the world is the best apologetic against the argument that the church is up to no good. Or to state it positively, Christians taking a submissive posture in the world is the best way to show that we are an agent of civic good in the world and for the world. Submitting to government authorities will silence the arguments that the church and therefore Christ are up to no good. And now he's going to turn from citizen government to individual with servant master. Look at verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Okay. Notice that it said servant and master versus what you typically would think, uh, slave, master. Um, that's because the word that's used here, it, it's a very specific word for servant. It's, it's that of a household slave. And so I, I need to say a couple of things about this. Uh, one, slavery in this context was nothing like slavery in the uh, or modern day race-based slavery. I, I don't have time to go into all the details of historic slavery in the first century world, but, but suffice it to say that slavery was nothing like what we think of as the race-based slavery of our day. 
However, um, or, or second, I should say, uh, they would have been thought of, this household slave would have been much closer to what we think of as an employee. Now that said, they were still thought of and treated like slaves, which meant that they, they were seen as people who were less than. And Peter gives the same command. The same command. Be submissive. Subject yourself to place yourself in a submissive posture, even to unjust masters. And so I want you to see the dignity here that Peter gives people who are first century slaves. When he says, even to unjust masters, Peter is assuming that you can treat a slave unjustly, which Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosopher, said this. He said, you, you can't treat a slave unjustly. It was common thought in the day that you can't treat slaves with, uh, in, in any way that is seen as unjust because they're not worthy of justice. They don't have the same human dignity or human rights that would lead you to, to see their treatment as unjust. And Peter is saying that's not true. Peter says absolutely not. You have unjust masters who are treating you with injustice. You have the dignity, you have dignity that comes with the image of God. All of you. All of you. You are worthy of justice. But we don't pick up the sword to get it. Have the same posture. Same posture. Marked by submission. Why, why would he say this to them? Let's keep reading verse 19. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Now this statement, these verses are, they are no, notoriously difficult to understand and to interpret. When it says that when you endure sorrow and unjust suffering, it is a gracious thing. Very difficult to understand what, what Peter is saying right here. But we don't shy away from the difficult things in the Bible. We dive in head on and we wrestle with them. So what does it mean when he says this is a gracious thing? Um, Karen Jobes, um, I cited her last week, wonderful New Testament scholar. Just She's a wonderful theologian. This is her understanding, our best effort at interpreting what that means. And I think, I think she's as close as anything I've found out there. That's what she says. Responding righteously to unjust suffering is commendable in God's sight. But grace here, the, the word grace, the, the gracious thing, but the grace thing, is in this, con in this context also implies that God's special favor rests upon the righteous sufferer of injustice. Translation. To all those who have experienced injustice, to any of you who have experienced injustice, for any reason, including race, sex, economic status, God sees you, God knows you, God loves you, He is with you, and He is for you. And I think this is where Christians need to confess and repent for participating in injustice over the last 2,000 years, including uh, recent centuries in our own country. The church has not been immune from getting it very wrong. And if that is something that causes you to wrestle with the Christian faith, to, to, to let doubt creep in, I, I I want you to know that, one, I understand. We understand. I just want to encourage you to wrestle with the failings of the church from inside the church. To, to wrestle from outside the church is like when I have an argument with my wife in my mind, but I never actually talk to her. Wrestle with the failings of the church from inside the church. Now, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see that there is a thread in the examples that Paul, I mean Peter, I'm sorry, gave. There, there's a thread that runs through it 
government, citizen, slave, master. And he, here's the threat. That in both cases, both cases, whether it is to the unjust government at that time, or to uh, the master, the unjust master, in, in both cases, the, the people are nothing more than simply an asset. Simply an asset. For the government, it was you are a civic asset. For the master, an economic asset. But nothing more than an asset there to keep people in power or build the wealth of someone else. Both of which completely dehumanizing. And so Peter, to a church facing dehumanizing injustice on both fronts, society and as individuals, says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to have your life marked by submission, neither of which comes natural. So what then is the trick? What's the secret to being able to live like this? Verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. We'll come back to that word in a second. So that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is Peter quoting Isaiah, bringing Isaiah on this passage that's, that's known as the suffering servant, written 700 years before Christ came into the world came into the world to suffer as a servant, to live a just life, and to die an unjust death in behalf of unjust people. To stand in the gap for you and for me, for people who have participated in injustice in this world. He came in and he died for us. How did Jesus live like this? How could Jesus come in knowing he was the suffering servant and go all the way to the cross and die at the hands of unjust people? How? By entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. By entrusting himself to the Father all the way to the cross. How could he possibly do that? Because here's what he knew. To the Father, he was not an asset. He was a son. He was a son. Jesus knew that to the Father, he was no asset. He was a Son, and in Christ, neither are you. You're no asset to God. You're not simply an asset. You're a child. You're a child. And when you believe in Christ, you are no asset. You're a child of the living God. And listen, if God simply saw you as an asset, Jesus would have never come and died for you. Never. 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 Listen, you don't die for an oil rig. You die for someone you love. I've never heard anyone say, you know what? That oil rig out there, it is worth me dying for. You die for people you love. Which means the God of this world came into an unjust world, lived justly, died at the hands of unjust people because he loves you. Loves you. If you were just an asset, he would have never died. But he came, and he is the good and just king who died for his subjects. He is the good and just master who died for his servants. And Peter says this, I want you to follow his example. I want you to follow his example. This is how you live like this out in the world. Follow his example. And that word example said we'd come back to it. it, it it's not just you know, look at someone. It, it, it was the word that was used for children in this day, learning to write. When you, you know, the dotted lines, you trace the letters and you follow the letters. That's the word he used. Look, look at Jesus' life, follow the dotted lines, copy it. Learn to copy it. Learn to trace it over and over and over as a child learns to write. Listen, soon, 
soon, the people Peter is writing to, they are going to need to know how to entrust themselves to the Father. To the one who judges justly, to the one who is going to set all unjust things right in the end. They were going to need to know how. Whether it was happening yet, we're not certain, we don't think so, but Nero was on his way. They were going to go from being scattered and marginalized to burned at the stake, and they were going to need to know how to trust the Father in the middle of that. They were going to need to know how to see a judgment that was coming and not bring it into today. They were going to need to know how to entrust themselves to God. They were going to need to know how to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. The one who knew the way up is down. The path to the resurrection is the cross. The one who knew that the road to power and authority is humility. This was the lesson that they needed, and it's one we need as well. It's one that we need as well. So we are going to have leaders, we're going to have bosses, and um, th th those who are in authority over us who are more just and less so. I mean, we're going to need to know how to navigate that life. We're going to need to know how to look at the, the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and appropriate that to ourselves so that we can live that life out in the world, following in his footsteps. We're going to need to know. And in both, whether we have authorities over us that are just or unjust, our life, the Christian life, the community of the church is to take a submissive posture out in the world, which is counterintuitive for all of humanity because it's the marker of a new humanity, a new humanity in Christ. May this be so of us, sojourn. Let me pray. Father, we pray that this marks us as a church, as a community, as people. We want to take our faith out into the public. We want to be out in the public square as Christians living a public faith. I pray that this is our posture as a church. When we agree and when we disagree, when we look at our leaders and we see them as just and as we, when we see them as unjust. I pray that our, our posture would be hearing and heeding the commands of the scriptures through Peter, through Romans. Be subject. That we would take a submissive posture out in the world, knowing how counterintuitive it is. But oh, how beautiful and glorious it is when we see that when we do that, we're putting the life of Christ on display. We are proclaiming the death of Christ in our posture. May this mark us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.